let's go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is we're going to have a little Q&A at the back half. We'll, we'll have Lindsay come out at the back, and then me and Lindsay can field some Q&A then. And so don't be worried. You'll get a chance to interact with Lindsay some more. And I really appreciate his passion and heart. I hope you were able to hear the, um, the love of theology, the love of knowing God, and the love of contemplating uh, these profoundly difficult topics in him. He is, uh, if you didn't know, you don't know, but he actually has spent a lot of time online um, interacting with a lot of atheists. And we used to, we used to do a lot of this through our apologetics.com site. We had a forum, which was very, very lively for many, many years. And Lindsay was our main um, facilitate, what would you call that? Moderator in these debate forums. And this isn't no, you know, um, random thing on MSN or Yahoo sort of comments or YouTube. I mean, this is big time, big time stuff. So if you at all have any history or interest in continuing ministry online, please chat with him afterwards because he spent years doing that. And Lindsay, there are a couple guys here that that really do spend a lot of time doing that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I tell you, that's the that's some of the best ways to really have your faith challenged. If you want to do some practice sessions, go online before you hit people, you know, on the street face to face, because that's a good way to do <laughs> some role. You could call it role playing, but they're real people. So, yes. So we're on. <laughs> So, um, if you have the notes in front of you, we're going to go ahead and go through those. It should be about 15 pages. It should say week 15, and at the top you'll notice it says philosophical apologetics, not worldview apologetics. All right. All right. So, for our popular sayings, you may have heard some things like this before. God is such a punk for letting this suffering happen. He's such a punk, and I've heard him called very bad names instead of punk. Or God is an evil God if he allows all of this suffering to continue. Or because of the presence of suffering and evil, God cannot be both all good and all powerful. And we'll talk about why people say that in a second. Or you may have heard, if God really exists, he, she, or it would never allow such evil. So maybe those things ring a bell to you. And these are very, very real comments from very, very real people who are going through or have been through some really real bad stuff. Some stuff that is just mind-boggling difficult to comprehend. And I am sure every one of us in here can raise their hand and say that they've gone through some mind-bogglingly bad stuff. Uh, I know I have. I go through it often. And if you know anything about my family, you will know why. I can sit here and tell you uh, my testimony, in a sense, about that. And um, you will be a part of my pain. <laughs> But uh, the problem of evil and the problem of suffering throughout the centuries are typically considered to be the biggest reason why people have a hard time believing in God. Uh, and th the problem of evil and the problem of suffering definitely creates the strongest emotional case for unbelief. So typically, someone's emotions uh, are influencing the intellectual life. Um, so our goal for the last half here is first to show that the best formulations of the problem of evil fall short of disproving God's existence. So the best formulations they can come up with fall short of disproving God's existence. Instead, the existence of evil even the unnecessary and extreme evil provide a compelling case and, tr 
and show the truth of Christian theism. So it kind of backfires on them. And you can use all of these things we will talk about because I guarantee you they will come up word for word, just like we're going to talk about. Word for word. And I'm going to give you some very practical responses. So our second goal is to show that, the, that an atheist's first problem, before they even present the problem of evil to the Christian, is to resolve how and why they speak of anything as objectively evil. How and why would they even call something evil in the first place? Before they present us with the problem, how could they say something is evil at all? So that without an objective moral standard, they have no right to say what is and is not evil. So that's our second goal. So first, let's tackle uh, how to um, respond to the problem of evil when it's presented to Christians. And I guarantee you, this comes online, and I've actually used some of this stuff online, and it totally worked. And all the atheists in the forum were uh, really pissed off and changing the subject and, and doing all sorts of other things to derail the conversation. And, and it didn't work. I kept bringing this back up, and they could not respond. So um, the problem of evil and suffering in the Christian responses. So again, there's an emotional problem of evil. People in, in this situation who have an emotional problem with evil um, and God usually are going through it. They're going through the fire. They're going through the struggle. They're going through the suffering. And they need a listening ear. They need prayer. They need counseling. Uh, and that's not really for our discussion tonight, although I have been in the counseling chair and I've been counseled, and I can tell you the intellectual uh, uh, response that we're going to give tonight doesn't work and is not applicable for the moments when people are grieving and suffering. Do not bring this up when people are going through it and need you to just hug them, cry with them, pray for them, and God forbid you give them a weird scripture that haunts them the rest of their life because <laughs> that happens a lot with Christians. We oftentimes give weird scriptures in those moments when people are just going through it. Please don't be that person. Just say, I'm sorry. I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. This sucks. I know it sucks. You don't have to give the perfect scripture. So keep that in mind in your moments of counseling. And the second thing to consider in those moments of counseling, and there's a million things to consider in how you work it out, is meditating on the cross and the suffering that Jesus chose out of his love is the best thing we can hope to do when we hit rock bottom and the world falls apart. Um, and I guarantee you that you as the counselor or you as the person being counseled, if you can possibly lift your eyes to Jesus and just focus on him for one moment, there is a breath of fresh air there. So keep that in mind. Yeah, so like, they're chaplains in hospitals, you know? My little brother, he's about to graduate from seminary with his MDiv degree, and he has to do a chaplaincy in order to graduate. Um, and so he has to spend like a month in the hospital. Um, and yeah, that's a weird thing, you know? And so you go through some chaplaincy training. Like, hey, don't say, hey, look, dude, you're about to die. You better get saved, you know? Um, and he's like a Buddhist, and he has no idea what you're talking about. So it's like you ha we have to be sensitive in every, in every little situation. Okay, so the, there's, there's a few different ways the problem of evil is presented intellectually speaking. So then these are what we're going to talk about for the apologetics part of the conversation. So there's the internal problem, problem of evil, and we call it the internal problem of evil because it's an internal issue to the Christian faith that the atheist will try to point out. So the Christians say that God is all-powerful and all-good, they say. But Christians can't have it both ways. God cannot be both all-powerful and all-good. He can be either one or the other. And this is the most common thing you will hear in these atheist forums online. The logical problem of evil and the probabilistic problem of evil is what they are presenting here in this internal um, problem of evil. So internal, again, meaning it has to do with the Christian doctrine about the attributes of God. 
So the logical problem of evil goes like this, its basic form. It's impossible for both God and evil to exist in the same universe. It's impossible for both God and evil to exist in the same universe. If God exists as an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God, evil then cannot exist. Or if evil exists, God cannot exist. It's one or the other. You can have an evil in the world or you have God in the world. You can't have both God and evil in the same world. And they say, since it is painfully more obvious that evil exists in the world because we all experience evil, thus God cannot exist. That's essentially the basic form. Because we know there's evil, and evil and God can't coexist in the same time and place, therefore God can't exist because we know evil does. So that's one form. And another form goes like this. If evil is real, God is either all-powerful or all-good, but cannot be both. If God is all good, he wouldn't want evil to exist and would have preferred a world without it or a world where it is minimal. Okay? So if he is all powerful, he would have used his power to create a world without naturally caused suffering and without evil chosen by humans. If he's all powerful, he would have not created a world like this. He would have had power to create a better world. If all, in thinking of bef before creation, that God said, okay, I'm going to create this particular type of world, it meant that he could have thought through all the possible worlds that he could create, and he chose to create one. So when we talk about possible worlds, Lindsay mentioned it, think of when God is sitting in heaven, because that's what he does, he sits, um, he is contemplating on his armchair, being an armchair philosopher, and he is thinking, which world should I create? And he's considering a vast display of possible worlds. Think of how many worlds God could have thought about. He could have thought about a world just like this one, but slightly different. He could have thought about a world in which John, instead of getting a PhD in physics, he got a PhD in um, basket weaving, let's say, underwater basket weaving. Um, so it, but everything else is the same. You're all here, we're all doing this, and all of history is exactly the same, but there's this slight difference. The PhD was in a different subject. That's it. And so think of then another type of possible world where God of could have chosen a, a, a very similar world to this one, almost the exact same one, but it's slightly different. And Chris is the president of the United States right now with that funky goatee thing. That is this possible world. That is the possible world he could have created. So you get the idea. So think about how many types of, po of worlds there could have been that God could have create could have uh, chosen to create. And so the atheist points out that if if he had a chance to create any world he wanted to, and he was powerful enough to create any world he wanted to, he chose to create this one with all of the suffering and all of the evil and all the pain. He could have chosen to create a world where there is no suffering, no evil, no pain. And so therefore, because he could have given us peace and human flourishing and all kinds of happiness, he gave us the suffering and therefore, he's either not all good or not all powerful. Because he could have done better if he wanted to or if he was more powerful. So because evil and suffering exist, back to your outline, in the world, he allegedly created. God is not all good or not all powerful. Therefore, the God that the Christians worship does, doesn't exist because they claim he is both God, um, all good and all powerful. So you hear both of these a lot online. So how does the Christian respond? We, we respond like this. The first thing we could say has to do with omnipotence, that God is all-powerful. It is possible that such a world exists, a perfect world with no suffering and no evil choices. Yes, it's possible. Of all the infinite number of possible worlds he could have created, there could be one where there's no evil and no suffering at all. 
He could have created that one. Yes, you're right. It is possible. However, it is impossible for God, for even God, to create such a world if humans have libertarian freedom. Freedom to do things without coercion. Making uncaused free choices. Libertarian freedom. So it's impossible, we know, for God to make a square circle because that sort of thing is just absurd. It doesn't exist. It's impossible to have such a thing. It's a self-contradicting notion. God can't do things that are, make things like a square circle. It just doesn't work. He cannot create a world that contains free creatures who he guarantees will always choose to do the right thing, always preventing evil and suffering. He can't create a world where he creates a free creature that always chooses right. He can't do that, because God can't make something that's free always do something he wants them to do. Great question. This is such a great question, because you have op you've opened up a whole new can of stuff right here. And honestly, yeah, I can't get into it, but I, if you talk to him about Calvinism, you guys can talk all night. Um, so we'll leave that after. But great question. So rather than God, it would be the free will human creatures who bring about the evil if they choose it. It's not God choosing the evil that comes about, but the, he allows the, the humans to freely choose it. So all it takes is the mere possibility that humans can achieve libertarian free will in this actual world. If it's possible that we can achieve libertarian free, wor free will in this actual world, then Christians can show that it's impossible for God to create a world containing free will humans to have no evil and suffering. So all we have to do in this conversation is show that it's possible that we have what's called libertarian free will, then we have refuted and defeated the logical form of the argument that hangs on omnipotence. Um, so if it is possible that humans have libertarian freedom, the same world is possible to have evil occur in it because we can cause evil to occur in it. If it's possible that a guaranteed no evil world exists, as it's only possible that a no evil world exists only if there are no libertarian human creatures in it. Because once you put a, a, a libertarian human creature in it, or, uh, not in the political sense, libertarian free will, then you have the opportunity for evil to arise. So God cannot guarantee an evil free world if the world has free will humans. God cannot guarantee an evil free world if the world has free will humans. So thus, it is possible for an all good and all powerful God to create a world with humans freely choosing evil. Uh, questions on that? Yes. No. Well, see, this is interesting because then you have to really get into what does it mean for God to decrease, decrease something and predestine someone to things to unfold in a certain way and how does God's sovereignty relate to that notion? Is God sovereign in everything and the minute details of things happening on the earth in every way, shape, and form? Or does God is God's sovereignty only committed to kind of the bigger things, you know, like who you marry or whether or not you choose him, um, things like that. So honestly, that gets into a bigger question. But yes, you can have somehow free will, predestination, and God's sovereignty and omnipotence at the same time. And this is one of the amazing parts about the Christian faith, because as you dive down into that topic, you find the wealth of knowledge that's been unearthed in the 2,000 years of uh, theological history that we have. And honestly, Lindsay is a great resource for that, because he's, he's an expert on the Reformation and all things related to the sovereignty of God. Um, so I will direct your question to him, um, hopefully later. Yes, sir. It does. You're talking right now, so it counts. Oh. 
just, just how I said it, uncaused free choices, and we can make uncaused free choices, or something that is without coercion. I mean, if when we do things, when we think things, when we believe things without coercion, that is what I'm defining as liberty. Let's keep moving forward. So the second thing we could say in regards to the atheist set up there is that God would prefer a world without evil if he were all good. So this is the other thing that the atheists were saying. So this is not necessarily true because God may prefer something else over a world without evil. He may prefer, as weird as it sounds, a world in which uh, a world that lacks evil is not his biggest priority. He may have other priorities. And so pain and suffering often bring about greater good in humans. It happens a lot. Discipline by parents uh, or a space between the parent and child, go to your room for three hours, is provided for ch children to learn a lesson. These sorts of things, the pain and suffering, oftentimes bring about good. So it's possible that God may have some overriding reason for our suffering. And it may be his discipline or his space between us. We, we talk about the hiddenness of God. That's a really big deal right now in apologetics. That God seems so hidden to us. He seems to be punishing us by sending, sending us to our room. And that's why he seems to not reveal himself and interact and intervene. This sort of space between us, to use the Dave Matthews song, um, brings about a greater good. So that it's possible that that's maybe something going on here. So as long as it is possible that God allows for evil and suffering for some reason that we know not of, he would not be less good. It's possible that if he allows the evil and suffering, and he has a greater reason for the evil and suffering we're feeling now, then if that is possible, that he has the reason is that he was going to bring about a greater good, then he would not be less good. Also, it's possible that the actual world has the most amount of good for the least amount of evil. So back to the possible world scenario. If it's possible that God had an infinite number of worlds to choose to create from, and he chose to create this one, he may have chosen the, the, the universe that allows for... The greatest amount of, of good units, you could say, the greatest volume of units of good to be produced, like it were a good producing, good uh, unit producing factory, he may have allowed for that type of universe to exist and the least amount of evil units to be produced. So if this world and this universe is that world that allows the greatest volume of good for the least amount of evil, then that's a good thing. God chose to create the best of the possible worlds. Yes. Yes. Don't you just love how apologetics here and the philosophy reveals theologies and, and the power of scripture when you bring that truth home in this dilemma? In this confusion we're kind of working through, Scripture is so enlightening, isn't it? I love how it just is so clear. It brings so much clarity. Thank you for that. So as long as it's possible that this world could be the world with the greatest goods for the least amount of evils, then he would not be less good. As long as that's possible, he would not be less good. So again, we're, we're responding to the attack on God's um, omnibenevolence. It's possible that this world may be a world that, that allows for the triumph of good over the worst of evil, that the light shines brighter in the darkest of nights. So think of the worst amount of evil in one chunk of time that has occurred on this planet, like the most grotesque types of evil that you can imagine. And think of good somehow showing that situation to be utterly terrible 
but somehow there's even a greater good that arises out of it because in that darkest of nights, somehow there's a light that shines brighter in that moment, and even more good comes of it. Think of the, that kind of a scenario. And so uh, as long as, as it is possible for good to triumph over the worst of evil in magnitude, we talked about evil in volume and good in volume. Now this has to do with evil in magnitude, the worst, the extreme, the excessive evil. As long as it is possible for good to triumph over the worst of evil, he would not be less good. So these are possible, and they are all that is needed to refute the component of the problem of evil, the logical problem of evil, regarding God's omnibenevolence. So thus, it is not necessarily true that he prefers a world without evil in light of these other possibilities. God could have other reasons that we know not of, and this could in fact be the best of all the possible worlds in, the, in this scenario. So in conclusion, we can say that it is not impossible that God exists and evil exists. It's not impossible. They both can coexist. So the atheist would have to prove here that God cannot have morally sufficient reasons for creating a world and permitting horrible evil to exist. Now, with the logical problem of evil, it's widely held that this issue has been solved. So the logical problem of evil is really not a problem anymore for Christians. Um, because once you can show that something is possible, then the logical um, contrariness of this view is resolved. Okay, so this is, um, this is because the atheist in this case bears an enormous burden of proof to prove that it is not possible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for creating a world like this. The atheist would have to know only what God knows. He would have to be omniscient to know that God couldn't have morally sufficient reasons for permitting this world, or for creating this world amongst all the possible worlds. Because this world could be the, the best world. It could have the most amount of good for the least amount of evil. So to recommend something for you, as an overview here, we can say that, one, we need to realize that the atheist assumes an enormous burden of proof. He assumes that the statements below are logically in, incompatible. Omnibenevolent and omnipotent God exists is incompatible with the statement evil exists. He assumes a norm, an enormous burden of proof with those two statements being logically incompatible. So all the theist needs to do is to show that it is possible that both exist. It's just possible. That's all we have to do here. We don't have to do anything more than that. And we need to keep the burden of proof on the atheists. We need to keep it on them. They have to carry this burden of proof because they are making the claim. All right. So any questions on that? It kind of seems that way. But when you read Jesus' interaction in the New Testament, he often, especially when he heals the man born blind, he says, this was done to reveal God's goodness to you, or something of this nature, um, so that God, God's glory would be revealed. No, it does seem to be that the, the discipline of the Hebrews, and you have the people, the certain figures that come up, you know, with David and others that go through these trials, you know, Joseph, you know, it seems like God is using suffering, you know, uh, uh, Jonah, you know, all these figures. the macro level, we have nations coming in to bring the chastisement and discipline to the Hebrews, and yeah, it's Job. I mean, you see it at the micro level and at the macro level. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and, God, and God's glory just shining through with all of the suffering we've endured.
<laughs> okay, well played. All right, we'll keep going here on that note. Okay, good stuff, guys. So the next thing we encounter... <laughs> if you can drive down... Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So we're called to be co-reconcilers, co-reconcilers with Christ. And I think you're getting to this point, Lindsay, that there is a mission and a calling on every one of us to start bringing the kingdom of God to its fullness in the here and now. So... So, yeah, in the New Testament, you see such admonition by Paul to care, to do what Jesus said, carry the cross, and he counted all joy. You know, the persecution, the suffering, the thorn in his side, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we could talk for hours about how much we are called to in, have Christ with us in that moment and reveal Christ's glory in that moment. And I think the church has done a poor job of shepherding Christians to be broken and and allow our brokenness to reveal Christ through our cracks. You know, this idea of being a, a vessel, uh, you know, a jar of clay, that part Paul talks about. You know, to allow our cracks to bleed through the glory of Christ. Let's keep moving, folks. Let's keep moving. I got to keep moving. I only got 10 minutes left and then we got to have a Q&A. Can you ask, ask it at the Q&A? Okay, we'll ask it at the Q&A. We'll, we, need, we have to keep moving. Let me go through and we'll do this and then Lindsay will come up. Okay, so we'll just keep going here. <laughs> so I got a couple more points and then we'll do Q&A. Um, and then, so let me just continue and we'll finish. Um, the probabilistic version of the problem of evil is what you may hear more than the logical problem of evil, given that the logical problem of evil easily falls. So the basic form of the probabilistic form of the problem of evil is this. Given all the real evil in the world, the evil of man and the, and the suffering caused by natural causes, it is highly improbable that God exists. It's not logically impossible. It's just highly improbable. You hear this a lot. For God could reduce the evil in the world without reducing the good. He could... He could do things in a way where evil is just reduced and good could just stay where it's at. You don't have to have more good or less good. You could just have less evil. God could, could do that, but he doesn't. So it's just highly improbable that God exists. So the first thing we could say is that relative to the full scope of evidence available to us, the Christian and the non-Christian, God's existence is still more probable than not. So you, when these conversations come up, you want to say, yes, you're right. You know, it does seem to say, it does seem to imply that if we just look at the evil and suffering by itself, it seems that there's no God interacting. It seems that way when we just look at evil and suffering. But when we start looking at the good that comes out of the evil and suffering and miraculous intervention and other... Um, humans that come to counsel in natural disasters and come to bring food and water. And then you start looking at all the evidence for the resurrection and all the evidence from science that reveals design in the universe. And then you start re looking at the, the reliability of the scriptures and you start compiling all this evidence to do an evidential approach. You can start saying, okay, well look, given the full scope of evidence in favor of God, the evidence for God not existing in light of the evil alone, that evidence seems small, the evidence in favor of God seems big. So that's the first response. 
The second thing we can say is that we are not in a good position to assess with confidence the probability that God has no morally sufficient re reason for permitting evils that occur. So we are just not God. We are not in a position to know in the future that because, say, um, some girl fell into a well and she died, you know, starvation or something. We can't say that 30 more people won't come to Jesus because of that situation 30 years from now. You know, it could happen. It's possible. So because we don't know all the weird things that happen on this earth that could bring God tons of glory, we can't say that these things happen for no reason. There, there could be a reason that we know not of. The third thing we could say is that the Christian theism by itself entails a bunch of doctrines that increase the probability of God and the coexistence of evil. So given the Christian worldview, the coexistence of God and evil is very, it makes a lot of sense. And it doesn't seem to be the case that God's existence is improbable. So you have the Westminster Shorter Catechism saying that the chief purpose of man is to, to know God and enjoy God and and bring glory to him forever, and that sort of language. And it has nothing to do with our happiness. It has nothing to do with us being suffering free or evil free. So we see this kind of um, theme in scripture too, that you, we ought to expect evil and expect suffering and expect God's glory to come in those moments. We also know that scripture teaches us that man is in a state of rebellion against God. And we see uh, the Christian doctrine laying out the, the idea that w with original sin, we are constantly at a, in a place where we can easily cause evil all the time, and it's expected. Also, within Christian theism, you have God's purpose not being restricted to this life, but spilling over into the next life. So although there may not be purposes for certain suffering and evil being revealed now, there could be a, a purpose that we understand in the next life and that will make it all make sense and finally we can say that within Christian theism knowledge of God is more valuable and is greater than all the evils that we can experience in this life Paul said um, to live as Christ to die is gain right um, you, you know with Paul you have um, Philippians 3 this tremendous path a passage of passion for, for hey, I'm willing to suffer it all for the sake of the gospel because I consider all of this rubbish to, to have the, the surpassing knowledge, the, the knowledge of Christ, to know Christ for who he is, to know him. And that makes everything worthwhile to go through anything. If I could just know Christ in that moment, and so in conclusion with the probabilistic version of the problem of evil, we could say that it is not improbable at all that God and evil coexist. In fact, it's highly probable given these um, discussions. So we're going to skip the next part on the, on the external problem of evil and just go to the Christian, uh, the doctrines of Christian theism and atheism. So to further along, uh, to further align ourselves with what we're talking about with Christian theism, the Christian explanation of evil and the future of it goes something like this. Christian, the Christian explanation asserts that evil is a real lack or corruption or privation of the good of creation. That, that's how some philosophers would put it. It's, it's a lack of or corruption of or privation of the good of creation. Uh, so it's the absence of good, as I believe Augustine puts it. Uh, it is possible because God gave humans the ability to choose good or evil. And this freedom was un un used unwisely, and as a result, uh, evil and suffering entered the world, and Christ defeated evil judiciously, and God will practically defeat it at the end of time. And in heaven, there's no more evil. So this Christian theistic understanding of the future and the reason for it and the history of evil and suffering is a great holistic system that makes a lot of sense. 
Now, how about the atheistic explanation of evil and the future of it? Well, the atheistic explanation asserts that evil is caused by a lack of knowledge and education against nature. It's just that we suck as engineers and doctors. That's the reason why there's evil and suffering, and only lately have we gotten better. But even lately, we kind of still suck because the levees in New Orleans, you know, were over flooded and, and all these things. So it manifests, according to the atheists, itself temporarily in sickness, disease, organic, economic, social, scientific issues, as well as natural disasters when humans can't engineer safety, security, and health. So it's, it's because we are not smart enough that evil and suffering continue. It's, it's a human thing. It all relates to us. It will only cease when humans design solutions and alleviate suffering through their power, effort, and ingenuity. So eventually, evil will be eradicated. What worldview does this sound like? Was it? Communism. We talked about it. I sent it home with you as an outline. Humanistic. Yeah. Eventually, one day, we will get there. We will continue our evolutionary path and our journey, and we will become that type of creature that has all sorts of power over creation, where we are the masters of our own destiny, where we can defeat anything that comes against us, any evil, any suffering, it will one day be eradicated because of us, because of our sacrifice, and because now, because of how good we are, our goodness becomes eventually what eradicates evil. It sounds very salvific. There's an alternative to the gospel here. So, and the last thing I'm going to say is, is that the atheists, before, before we need to respond as Christians to the problem of evil, the atheists have a bigger problem with evil. Their problem of evil is unresolved. Ours, we have great answers to, and we have resolution. What is the atheist problem with evil? It's that they don't have an understanding of pure, objective evil. All they have is a subjective understanding of evil, and their explanations of where evil comes from, frankly, fail. And um, we don't have the time to get into it, but if you continue through here, you'll see that, number one, they actually affirm objective evil in their statements, even though they say that it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an absolute standard of goodness or evil. So, but in their other statements, they affirm that there is evil. So they're self-contradicting. And two, that their explanations for what evil is and where it comes from fail. Usually, the best thing they can do is bring it back to socio-biological concerns about how we evolved. And because we needed to form packs and groups in our uncivilized, primitive cultures, that, um, that led to protection against predators. We were able then to um, learn how to coexist together and live together and form nice society bonds, even though we really couldn't think rationally of what we were doing. This, sorts, this sort of pattern in our primitive state led to um, our genes um, coming about where we now naturally learn how to coexist with each other, and this notion of goodness and evil is really just this thing that comes from our primitive state where we learn to be together and stay together so we can avoid becoming prey. So it's a, it has a socio-biological explanation, and frankly that explanation fails, and we talk about that here, and if you need more resources on that, I could refer you to that. So um, with that, let's bring Lindsay back up, and we'll ask you a couple questions. <laughs> so uh, uh, questions for Lindsay, we have about five minutes. <laughs>